So, Paco, I hear that a lot of your data clients are in industry these days. Yes, I've been making a point to try to get out of Silicon Valley, out into the rest of the world, and take a look at use cases beyond the uh, sort of the e-commerce and ad tech and all that we have so much in Silicon Valley, uh, but look more towards manufacturing and energy and agriculture, transportation, these kinds of things. So instead of trying to control people and what we're buying, you're <laughs> actually controlling the manufacture or distribution of things and so forth. Exactly. It's much more about things. There's actually a lot more things than people. So, uh, uh, and, and we use this too, right? Uh, agriculture, uh, transportation, energy, these are in our daily lives so much. What's an interesting story you can tell of um, some company that uses your data? Uh, well, as, as far as large data, I think that one of the most interesting stories I've seen uh, over the past several travels was working in Austin, uh, some of the folks at National Instruments, they make uh, ADD converters, which are at the heart of sensors. So we talk a lot about sensor arrays and Internet mm -hmm. of Things, but when you really drill down to it, you have some kind of analog process and you have to convert it into digital to be able to use the data. And they have such a wide range of, of different use cases that we were talking about, uh, General Electric being one of them, which makes you know, an amazing array of different products, uh, whether they're working with data coming off of aircraft engines and commercial aircraft in flight, or whether they're working with uh, power generators or you know, some sort of medical device in a hospital. Uh, it's just a, enormous data rates that I think would be surprising to people when you consider, uh, okay, so one stat, the sensors that measure the bearings on uh, aircraft engines for commercial flights, uh, that's generating, uh, the figure was like 12 exabytes a day. Uh, and it's just for the commercial flights, just for that one kind of sensor, making sure that an engine isn't ready to go out. And can you imagine that that's thousands of times of what we would see in a large social network? And you also want real-time uh, analytics, I imagine. How, how on earth can we bring this all in the cloud and analyze it and give decision makers real-time feedback, exactly? And uh, do you need any sp new algorithms? Have you been looking at something that's different because of the size or the variety of the data? Very much so. I think that there is uh, a, a very interesting body of work in terms of what's called probabilistic data structures or sketch algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in particular, there's been some great work by uh, uh, Twitter, uh, sort of in their ramp up to IPO, they reworked a lot of their, their analytics for revenue apps. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, Oscar Boykin, Avi Bryant, uh, some of the others there who are building that out, have done great work on uh, open source for probabilistic data structures. And I see this as being the, the kind of of math that needs to be applied for industrial applications if we're to move forward. Because otherwise the data rates are just too large. You also mentioned agriculture, and I understand that's sort of a passion. Absolutely, for you. absolutely. yes. Uh, I, I definitely have some agriculture on both sides of my family, uh, particularly my mom's family off in, in Colorado. We're, we're ranchers from a long ways back. Um, and I grew up in an area of California that's rural and very much agricultural. Um, I'm working with clients in agriculture because of the sensors, uh, particularly water sensors. Uh, right now in California, we have uh, an, an enormous drought going on. Uh, it's beyond an extreme drought. It's an extreme exceptional drought, I believe, or some kind of nomenclature like that. Uh, the priorities for using resources in agriculture are amazing. Uh, the, the, the access to fresh water is declining. Uh, the rates of uh, snowpack variants in the mountains mm -hmm. for where the runoff comes from, those are increasing. Yeah. So there's climate issues. Uh, the other inputs, nitrogen and phosphorus, the sources on these are, mm -hmm. are uh, declining as well. And yet, almost half the people in the world make a living in agriculture. Yeah. And it's $15 trillion a year in terms of economy. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a very big thing. And uh, is the water measured through satellites or sensors? What do you uh, it's, see? It's interesting. I mean, we, we're getting much better kinds of satellite telemetry now. Uh, companies like Planet Lab and Skybox and all that are working with microsats. Uh, they're getting much better, uh, you know, one meter resolution. I believe the government's recently opened it up to 20 centimeter resolution. So satellite data is interesting, but it's not as actionable. It's a little too high. Uh, what you really need is to get sensors in the ground near the roots. And yet, there's a lot of structural problems in agriculture. Uh, there's some great vendors for that, but there's going to be a lot of problems in terms of 
uh, you know, what's the data privacy issues, and how can we look at aggregates and, and tie this data into a broader picture that may be coming from satellites or drones. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting data problem. And I imagine that um, an agribusiness in the U.S. or Europe could probably afford this, but what about places in the world where people are really starving and really have to make the agriculture work? Exactly. There's a lot of trade-offs. I mean, uh, I have my own feelings of, uh, well, coming from California and all, I mean, certainly there's a lot of uh, argument about uh, GMOs and, and, and sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, etc. Um, elsewhere in the world, there's, there's other priorities as far as how do we feed mm -hmm. n billion people. Uh, a lot of trade-offs on this. I find that there's actually some surprising effects where a lot of the newer technology in agriculture is actually coming from southern hemisphere, outside the U.S. Mm. Um, Chile, in particular, has been one of the countries that's really stepped up to sponsor startups. And that's interesting because you usually think of technology innovation as being in Silicon Valley, yeah. but it's not. Yeah, there's reverse innovation, too. Exactly. Yeah, and I think in a lot of these areas, the farmers are really worried about the cheap imports, and they have to compete. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. I think that in the U.S., a lot of the innovation <laughs> that I'm seeing is actually on the smaller organic farms. They're near a metro area. They have a sort of a built-in audience that they can really afford to innovate, whereas the large corporate farms may have a bit more inertia. Uh, a little, they struggle more with how do they change the process. Interesting, and that's an old story. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I just wanted to ask you, what interesting open source project is your interest right now? Certainly, I, I've been working a lot with uh, Apache Spark, and I've, I've been working, to step back a bit, I've been working with abstraction layers for big data, and I'll be giving a talk here about that a little bit uh, tomorrow. Um, but Spark is a, is a kind of unified abstraction layer, if you will, where it handles real-time, uh, interactive queries, batch, like Hadoop does, SQL, there's graph support, etc. But the idea is to take a lot of different kind of use cases and be able to have a, a, a common engine. And uh, I'm particularly interested in the real time, the streaming aspects of this. Again, because of the industrial or agricultural applications, uh, I, I find that this is where some of the more advanced math can really come into play for industry. From a cursory look at Spark, I got the impression it can uh, take some of the burden off of the programmer of figuring out how to divide up the data and apportion it. Yeah. Yes, very much so. It, it, it goes back to math from the 1930s. Alonzo Church right. talking about applicative systems and combinators, and lambda calculus, and these kinds of things. But it's, it's a way of having, at a higher level, a program, programmer can be working in, say, Python or Java or Scala or are these days even, uh, but they can be working at a higher level language, not thinking about how the data is partitioned across a thousand machines. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that complexity is abstracted out. Yeah. And you can really focus on, functionally, what do you have to do with the data. And do you think the SQL part is useful, or do you, would you use other methods? Well, it's interesting with Spark, the idea is to mix and match. Mm -hmm. So you can go from a query and have the results of the query be... Uh, represents an RDD, and then do functions applied to that RDD, and then vice now versa. That is a here. RDD is a Scala concept. No, no it's no. it's um, uh, the idea in uh, Spark. There's an RDD oh, no. is a, a resilient distributed data set, okay. a, a data set that can be sent out across a cluster, right. and then you can apply functions to it to get what you need, the unit of work you need. And the notion there is that you can go back and forth from a SQL table mm -hmm. to an RDD. Okay. or to a graph, back to RDD, or you can use these RDDs to build up machine learning uh, algorithms, or you can build an RDD out of a, a time window in a, a real-time stream. So it's a nice central kind of data abstraction that, that ties these things together. It sounds like it combines many areas that were more or less separate before, and Exactly. Therefore, a programmer has to understand all those areas all of a sudden. Exactly. I mean, when you, when you look at Hadoop, uh, I mean, I've really enjoyed using Hadoop a lot, and I still do it, but when you look at the history of Hadoop, this is going back 12 years now, the MapReduce API out of Google, and it was built in a time and an, uh, environment where people were worried about uh, spinning disks failing. Mm -hmm. If you had thousands of machines, the disks were going to fail. And the economics of data centers, the technologies have changed over the past decade, quite dramatically. 
Um, Spark is stepping back and saying, well, we had Hadoop, and then we had you know, dozens of other kinds of specialized systems because Hadoop wouldn't do all of it. But how can we step back and use the contemporary architectures, the contemporary equipment, and make a more general pattern, and then surface it at a level that's easier for many more programmers to access? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you.